want to welcome everyone here this evening. Thanks for spending time with us. This is, as you know, the second of a four-part series focused on endodontic therapy. It's called This is an Endodontic Therapy, and it explores topics of diagnosis and preparation, obturation, and ultimately filling of the root canal space. It's sponsored by Kerr Endodontics and offered for those of you who are next DDS users, and thanks for joining that community. If you're not a part, please uh, take the time to do so now and mention it to a friend, too. We've got a host of great resources to support you while you're going through your training. Part of that involves our guest for this evening, Dr. Gary Glassman. It's my pleasure to introduce him on our behalf. I run the academic affairs for the next EDS, and I've known Dr. Glassman for quite a few years now and had the opportunity to hear him speak and hear his insights on a number of occasions. It's really my pleasure to have him here with me tonight to talk about uh, endodontic therapy and preparation of the canal space. He's going to share a little of his background in just a moment or two. Um, but first, let's just cover a couple of quick ground rules. We're going to go almost an hour tonight in the presentation, and if you have any questions along the way, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat window or raise your hand and share them with me as your moderator. I'll queue them up to Dr. Glassman, and after he finishes the, the didactic portion of the program, he'll take as many of those as we can during the course of tonight's uh, agenda. And so with all that business out of the way, let me introduce you to Dr. Gary Glassman. Thanks, Rick. Well, it's uh, certainly great to be here, and um, I'm excited tonight because uh, we have a, a lot to talk about, and uh, hopefully we'll stimulate some really good interest. I'm a full-time endodontist. I have a private practice limited to endo in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I'm also on staff at the University of Toronto, Faculty of Dentistry, and uh, also uh, adjunct professor of dentistry and Director of Endodontic Programming for the University of Technology in Kingston, Jamaica, and I'm proud to say that we just graduated our first class of 22 DMDs in, uh, in Kingston, Jamaica. A long uh, process, but well overdue. Tonight, we are going to first review some of the diagnostic principles that we discussed last month discuss proper isolation of the site because when you start root canal treatment, it's important that we isolate. And that means placing rubber dam on any tooth that's going to have root canal treatment. We're going to cover straight line access before we can negotiate that root canal space. And we'll highlight some clinical landmarks and give you some troubleshooting tips on how to sort of demystify that access preparation. Because I know, like you, when you first make access into that tooth and you lose resistance, uh, sometimes you get a, a fear in your mind going, hmm, did I perforate or did I actually get into that pulp chamber space where I really need to go? So we're going to discuss that as well today, how to make it easier for you, how to look for landmarks and how to make sure that we don't panic when we first lose resistance going into that pulp chamber space. And we'll have an opportunity to answer any of your questions that you may have uh, at the end of the presentation. So reviewing webinar number one, it's important that we understand that the primary objective of dentistry is number one, to prevent oral disease and to retain the natural dentition wherever we possibly can. And of course, the primary goal of endodontics is to eliminate and or to prevent apical periodontitis while maintaining as much natural tooth structure as we possibly can. We are in an era of minimally invasive dentistry, and we take that one step further into endodontics because we want to maintain the structural integrity of the tooth in order that we can satisfy that objective. Now, the success of endodontics is multifold. There's a lot of moving parts with respect to providing our patients with successful root canal treatment, and we're going to discuss that as well and review that a little bit later. But the objective, number one, is to find all the root canals, get to the apical termini, remove the smear layer, that inorganic, organic layer that's created on the wall of the root canal during instrumentation, get rid of any microbial inoculation, obturate the root canal system in three dimensions, and then subsequently restore it back to function. So tonight, we're going to review access and the principles of root canal preparation. Now, if you remember last week or last month when we went through diagnosis, there's a simple mnemonic for engaging in a systematic diagnostic protocol, and that's SOAP, 
First of all, you have to interview the patient. Get as much information as you possibly can in order to understand their complaint and how they're feeling. Number two, do your clinical tests. And coming to a diagnosis, both a pulpal diagnosis and a periridicular diagnosis. Once we assess all that information and we have our diagnosis, then we can plan for treatment. And remember what we talked about last month in webinar number one. If you can't diagnose, you don't treat. You reassure the patient that you're available, prescribe any anti-inflammatory or pain medication, and reassess perhaps in a few days or a week or when the discomfort may localize to that particular area or particular tooth. Now, when we access into the pulp chamber, before we can even consider doing that, we need to isolate the area. And as I go around the world and I lecture to different groups, I'm amazed and still surprised that over 90% of dentists worldwide, when they do their root canal treatment, don't use rubber dam. And as far as I'm concerned, if you can't put a rubber dam on a tooth, that tooth has no business having root canal treatment done on it. So as you can see on the screen on your left, we have a nice rubber dam set up. It's simple, it's easy. We punch the hole right in the middle of the rubber dam, so the tooth is in the middle of the frame of reference. Now, as you can see from the broken down tooth here, I would never consider doing routine root canal treatment on a broken down tooth for many reasons like this. Number one, I need pulp chamber space to confine my ear against, and I wanna make sure that I have good isolation. So as Dr. Kapilov has show, will show you here, he does what's called the donut technique, where he'll place composite resin, flowable composite, light cure it, and build it up in order to provide and simulate that pulp chamber space. So now we have good isolation. Now we're ready to go. Now we're ready to do our root canal treatment. Now, of course, in order to confine our irrigants and prevent our saliva from getting into the tooth where we want to maintain as much asepsis as possible, one of the main reasons why we use rubber dam is to prevent consequences such as this, like aspiration of instruments, swallowing of instruments. So whatever we do in dentistry, certainly whatever we do in endodontics, it's always safety first. And I want to get that out of the way first. Now, placing the rubber dam sometimes is a little bit of an art, sometimes a little bit of a science. But what we want to do is place that hole right in the middle of the rubber dam so the tooth is in the middle of the frame of reference. And make sure that you allow your patient to breathe. That's so important. Now, if we punch a hole as if we're doing our restorative dentistry, let's say we're working on the upper first molar, then you really don't have a lot of room. You're confining yourself. So we want to place it in the middle of the rubber dam. In addition, if you punch your hole too high, then it sits too far down in the patient and you have a gap and an opening in his mouth where you can drop instruments. And if you have the hole too low, then of course it's gonna cover the patient's airway and they won't be able to breathe. So make sure it's in the middle of the rubber dam. All right, enough said. So access into the pulp chamber, creating that perfect access probably is one of the most frustrating things that we encounter. And I've done over 50,000 cases in my lifetime as an endodontist. And still, you get that sort of fear when you go into that pulp chamber, right? And I know you are. I know you're feeling that because if I'm feeling it, you're feeling it. So first thing we wanna do is we wanna have as much to our advantage as possible. You wanna remove all unsupported restorations and decay, wherever you can. Eliminate areas of marginal leakage and isolate sites of perforation and isolate it so you can visual, visualize fracture lines or craze lines within the pulp chamber space. So relax, isolate, take a breath, and get ready to access into that pulp chamber space. Right? And that's important because you're going to hear so much about straight line access. And straight line access sort of means joining that pulp horn to the orifice, right? to the apical terminus and joining them in a straight line right to the point of curvature. If we can't get right to the, to the, um, to the apical terminus right away because of curvatures. And recognize the impact of aging and attrition and 
Don't be afraid to take off-angle x-rays. I recommend that you take at least two radiographs, a straight-on one and maybe an angled one, because we're dealing with a three-dimensional object, but really we're looking at a two-dimensional image. And then we need to visualize how that tooth looks like in three dimensions. So what a bite wing does, it allows us to orient the tooth a little bit better in an occlusal apical and a mesial distal direction. Now, again, we're in the era of minimally invasive dentistry, but this is ridiculous. Should never preclude proper design and execution of an access preparation. We want to make sure that we have high visualization, high magnification, and fiber optic illumination so we can see what we're doing because you can't treat what you cannot see. Reduce the occlusion for a couple reasons. Number one, if the patient's a Bruxer, then after root canal treatment, there will be some periapical inflammation, which is quite normal. So if the patient's a Bruxer and they contact their teeth together, at least those teeth won't be in contact in order to increase that, that discomfort that the patient may be experiencing afterwards. In addition, by reducing the occlusion, we'll be able to have more stable reference points rather than having you know, an off-angle occlusal plane. Just make it nice and flat, especially if that tooth is going to be prepared for a crown later on. So once again, we got a two-dimensional image looking at a three-dimensional object. So let's visualize it in three dimensions, if we can, by taking off-angle x-rays. Just a simple caveat before we begin. Now, when we enter that pulp chamber space, you're going to see a lot of different colors. And those colors will help orient you to find the root canal, what's, root, what's pulp chamber space, what's pulp chamber floor as well. The pulp chamber floor will appear like this marble-like color. And in a well-hydrated tooth, it'll glisten in your eyes. And you'll often see the orifices of the canals joined by the embryological fusion lines. Now, I did an article many years ago with Dr. Sashi Nalapati of Kingston, Jamaica, and we looked at, um, at using this material that, uh, that ophthalmic surgeons use to detect the epithelial defects in the cornea, and it attracts, just like food coloring, really, it's attracted to connected tissue. So we flood the chamber with this, with fluorescein sodium, and when you shut the lights off, it fluoresces. And it really allows us to detect where those root canals are. And take a look now at the color change of the floor of the pulp chamber. Look at that marble-like appearance. It's wonderful. I love seeing that. And then joining the embryological fusion lines, it, it provides you with a, let's say, a roadmap in order to find all the canals. So the law of orifice location basically means that the orifices of the canals will be at the junction between the floor of the pulp chamber and the wall of your access preparation. That's where it exists. No further do we need to extend it out because there's no root canal space that cross the external oblique ridge in a maxillary molar, let's say. So as you can see, you've got the nice color changes. You've got the de yellow detinal walls. You've got that marble-like appearance of the pulp chamber floor, and you can see the canals quite, quite well. Now, my good friend Cliff Ruddle shows this beautiful, beautiful case. This is the ideal access. We call this a class one inlay preparation, where if you close one eye and look up or down the access, you can visualize all the canals. So when you place an instrument in that tooth, whether it's a stainless steel file or a nickel titanium file, the first place it makes contact is in the root canal wall, in the radicular dentin, not scraping along the wall of the access, because we don't want to increase or cause cyclic fatigue on the instrument before it actually enters the root canal. And as you can see, joining the cusp tip to the pulp horn, to the orifice, and to the point of curvature, you can get beautiful tactile control by managing even the most severe curvatures by removing the dentinal restrictions coronal to them. Now, the mechanical objectives with root canal preparation is to create this gradually tapering funnel where we have a series of decreasing diameters where the smallest diameter is at the apical terminus. Removing all detonal restrictions coronal to it so our instruments will passively approach that apical terminus. Now, we first need 
tools to use. And genius is nothing more than having the right tools. And my favorite burr is the 557 Crosscut Fisher burr. I love this burr. It's great for getting through metal. It's great for getting through composites. It's great for getting through amalgam restorations, enamel and dentin alike. Now, one of the problems I've all, all, all often encountered is when I'm going through zirconia crowns and I have the conventional diamond and I'm making access in order to get to the dentin. And everyone has this problem. What do you get? You get sparks, right? No one likes sparks coming out of a patient's mouth. The, the Zircut burrs are proprietary made. I'm not sure it's a big secret how they're manufactured, but I'll tell you whether it's zirconia crowns or porcelain, it's like taking a hot knife through butter. No chatter, no sparks, and allows you to get through that ceramic crown with ease. Now this is called the LA Access Burr. It's a tapered diamond burr that's safe ended, beautiful for refining your access before I do my final refinement with my ultrasonic. Not just any ultrasonic, I'm not talking about a magno constrictive cavitron, I'm talking about a piezoelectric ultrasonic with specially designed tips. I use it in pretty well every case. I use it to refine my access, I use it to uncover calcified canals, I use it to remove pulp stones very, very, very precisely without the risk of gouging the pulpal floor like you'd often get or risk with a high-speed drill or a surgical length round burr. My favorite tip is the CT4 diamond coated tip by Kerr. It's about a 60 degree angle. It works beautifully. You can autoclave it. You can use it many times and it has a beautiful diamond abrasive on it. Once again, I use it to section cores in addition to removing posts and all the other applications that I just mentioned. Now this is a typical case that I would see in my office. Calcified case where the dentist decides after several years of experience not to tackle it, not to risk perforation, but to send it along. And when we treat cases like this, what I like to do is I like to shape the canals I can find first for a couple of reasons. Number one, I want to get some work done. I don't want to start looking for that MB2 canal for the first hour and then after my hour, hour and a half is up, I have to bring the patient back and I've got nothing done. So I want to get some work done. So if I have to bring the patient back for a second visit, then all I have to do is focus on the task at hand and find that MB2 canal. In addition, when you shape the canals you can find, it redefines the anatomy of the floor of the pulp chamber to allow you that opportunity to really have a roadmap built for you. And now you can sort of follow that, those embryological fusion lines, join the canals together, and look for that MB2 canal. And I use my ultrasonic, like I said, to find that MB2 canal pretty well routinely. You can see here that Dr. Castellucci has found his DB and his palatal canal, which is under the palatal cusp, and the MB canal. Now he's looking for that MB2 canal. We use these ultrasonic tips in a very, very, very light brushing motion. We have a little saying here. The Lighter the touch, the faster the cut. If you push really hard with these ultrasonics, they're not going to be very efficient. In addition, they're more efficient when you cut with them dry. But when you cut with them dry, they build up heat and they discolor the dentin. So every couple of seconds, my assistant will spray some water in order to restore the color and to reduce the heat. And we go very slowly. Now that MB2 canal will track under that pulp chamber floor both palatally and mesially. So we want to bring it back out and as we shape that canal, you'll see the orifice probably move more towards that mesial buccal root. And that's that MB2. That's the, that's the one thing that we'd like to find is that MB2 canal. Because the tooth that I treat the most, retreat the most, is that maxillary first molar where the MB2 canal has not been found. So here's a case that we treated, that I went into it, the, found that MB, treated the DB, treated the palatal canal, and you can see where I initially was trying to find that MB2 canal. But you can actually see where it is. And after I shaped it, we sort of drag it out mesially and more towards the, the buckle. 
and it's important because the AAE, the American Association of Endodontists, has boldly come out and said that almost, and I repeat almost, 100% of maxillary first molars contain that MB2 canal. That may be overambitious to think we're going to find it 100% of the time, because certainly there's many that don't have it by virtue of the fact that now we have three-dimensional imaging and we know exactly what the shapes of the root canals are and the shapes of the actual roots. So it gives us a little more diagnostic information. So we got to look for it. We got to exhaust all our efforts to find all the canals in order to satisfy the objective of endodontics, which is to eliminate or prevent apical periodontitis. So going back to this case, once I've shaped these canals that I've found, the MB, the DB, and two palatal canals in this case, I trough with my ultrasonic, very, very gently, very light touch, until I remove that dentinal restriction and find that MB2 canal. So you can see from the final radiograph, we have separate orifices and separate apices of the MB root, a lateral canal mid root, two palatal canals that join in a common apex, and a distal buccal root canal as well. Five root canals. Well, six if you count the lateral canal. So when we look at maxillary anteriors, you know, I often think of, well, this is probably the easiest tooth in the mouth. But you know what? I never rely on that sort of idea. We want to make sure that we make proper straight line access, which may mean going into the incisal edge ever so slightly and get straight line access because we also want to remove any tissue that may be in that facial aspect of that tooth because we don't want to get that proverbial discolored tooth. You know, Granny used to, you know, accept the fact that after she had root canal that that tooth was discolored, but no longer. We understand that if you remove all the tissue, then you'll decrease that chance. So we first penetrate through the cingulum into the pulp chamber and we want to make sure that we not only get rid of the lingual triangle of dentin but also the incisal triangle as well just like you see in this photo of course because of cosmetics and aesthetics we do compromise our access somewhat but ideally this would be the ideal access preparation in a maxillary anterior tooth and you can see what i like to do sometimes is even take a ultrasonic or a round burr, surgical length burr, and peel my way out, never directing it apically, but peeling my way out occlusally in order to remove that dentinal triangle and also remove any tissue that may be caught under that incisal edge that could lead to discoloration. Right, so we make our access, and then with a round burr and or ultrasonic, remove that overhang and remove any tissue that we may remaining that could discolor that tooth. Now, mandibular anterior teeth, over 50% of them have that lingual canal. And that's important to understand. I mean, we've known from the studies of Bertucci and Green and Wu and Cutler from the years before that these canals exist. And we have to understand that because the objective of root canal is to remove all that tissue that could lead to apical periodontitis. And we have to find all the canals to do that. So again, Go into the incisal edge ever so slightly because if you don't, you're going to leave tissue that may discolor the tooth and you may not access that lingual canal. Over 50% of these lower anterior teeth have a second canal. Now, little tip. Here, this could represent a lower anterior, it could represent a lower bicuspid that has two canals. It could represent that lower second molar where you only find that mesial buccal canal and the lingual canal, mesial lingual branches off below the orifice. So my simple tenet is this, shape the canals you can find. The canal that we drop into first off, most of the time in these teeth, is the buccal canal. So shape it completely. Then direct a carbon steel file or even a stiffer, maybe a number 15 hand file, and pre-curve it and direct it towards the lingual. If it drops in real easy, without resistance, then you're probably in the canal you just shaped, which is the buccal canal. But if we orient it towards the lingual and we get a little bit of a resistance and a little bit of a catch, then what we'll do is we'll just sort of peck our way out and remove 
that lingual area of dentin that's preventing us from falling into it uh, easily. And we continue that until we get good straight line access. And we don't place a nickel titanium file in that tooth until we own that canal from orifice to apex and create what we call a glide path, which we'll start discussing very, very shortly. All right, so just a little trick and a little tidbit on how to access those lingual canals. Maxillary premolars, most of them have, first premolars have two root canals, some one, 7% of them may have a third canal as well. So expect the unexpected. If you find one canal, look for two. If you find two, look for three. Right? Sometimes there can be four and even five. That's the wonderful thing about the human anatomy. Always expect the unexpected. Make your access directly into the pulp chamber and then peel your way out. Mandibular premolars, 25% of them may contain a lingual canal. Again, shape the canal you can find first off, which is the buccal canal, and then direct your file, orient it towards the lingual so you get a catch and manage it in the way we just discussed. Lower premolar teeth. Often we see the case of the disappearing root canal where all of a sudden you see the canal stop and it looks like it calcifies. But if the radiographic beam is coming from the buccal direction and we have a buccal and lingual root canal, because of the increased thickness of dentin, it appears as if there's no canal. But in actuality, that canal has bifurcated. So understand the anatomy, understand what it would look like on the radiograph preoperatively. Right? Beware of multiple canals. Crazy teeth, lower premolars. Sometimes there's one, sometimes there's two, sometimes there's three. The human anatomy is so variable. Right? In this particular case, we found two canals, two orifices. We shaped them. We obturated them. After, of course, we cleaned them. And you can see here, we've got a little tributary, a little branch, a little apical delta. And that's where a lot of the anatomy exists, is at the apical one-third. And we rely on our irrigants and our mechanical delivery systems to deliver those irrigants right to the apical terminus safely, which will be the subject of webinar number three. Maxillary molar tooth, okay. First molar, MB2 canal, look for it, right? Try to find it. Exhaust all your efforts without, of course, compromising the structural integrity of the tooth and without hopefully perforating that tooth, which is a great fear of all of us and all of ours. Maxillary second molars, very difficult to treat, but understand the concepts, which we'll take you through in a few moments, of straight line access and create a proper glide path in order to allow our nickel titanium files to follow the smooth pathways in which we created with our stainless steel hand files. And of course, mandibular molar teeth. We talk about the what we call the law of symmetry. And essentially, the law of symmetry means that when you take a line and you join it mesial distally in the center of the tooth, the distal canals should be pretty well symmetrical to the mesial. If it's off, let's say that you only have one canal in the distal and it's off to the buccal, then chances are there's another distal canal. But if it's right in the center, chances are there's just one. Now, if we look at some of these mandibular molar teeth, see most of them contain two mesial canals and one or two distal canals. But sometimes, anywhere between 1 and 15%, depending on the literature that you read, there's often a mid-mesial canal. So once we've shaped the canals we can find, then trough with your ultrasonics, use a sharp DG16 Endo Explorer, and look for that mid-mesial canal because bacteria know no boundaries, even though there may be common apices, right? If bacteria exist, they could leak and lead to either no healing or failure of that root canal if not cleaned out properly, All right? And this is what it may look like in cross-section. So let's talk about shaping and cleaning, right? We've made our access, we've gotten over the fear, we've taken a deep breath, we've found all the canals we think we've found, and now we're ready to do some shaping. But we have to understand some key concepts. Number one is the concept of taper. Now we're gonna be talking about files of, that have differing tapers and differing tip sizes. 
So for instance, a file that has a 0-2 taper, also called an O2 taper, also known as a 2% taper, means that for every millimeter you go up that file, the diameter of the file increases by 0.02 millimeters. If a file has a 0-6 taper, also known as a 6% taper, it means that for every millimeter you go up that file, that file increases in diameter by 0.06 millimeters and so on and so forth. Now it's important, as we talked about, by reducing the occlusion, not only will it provide our patients with a little bit of pain-free sleep after their root canal treatment, because if they do brux, it'll be out of their occlusion, but it also provides us with a stable reference point when we determine our working length. And our working length is defined as that distance between the occlusal reference point and the apical terminus. Now, initially, when a file is placed into a tooth, right, it binds high up in the file and high up in the canal. Just like Santa Claus's belly represents the taper and his tip represents the tip of the file, in order to allow that file to drift passively to that apical terminus, we have to incrementally remove tissue dentin from the crown down to the apical terminus. Because that dimension, that apical dimension, doesn't really change over time. What does change is the calcification's coronal to it. Because when a tooth is subject to insult and injuries such as fillings and cracks and trauma, is that pulp will deposit calcium from the coronal down to the apical one-third. So we need to incrementally remove that, those dentinal restrictions in order for our files to advance to the apical terminus. Again, satisfying that mechanical objective of creating that gradually tapering funnel. Concept number two is the concept of apical patency. Wow, this is taking a 08 hand file past the apical terminus anywhere between 0.25 and 0.5 millimeters throughout our procedure. Wow, we're actually taking a file out into the periapical tissues. And we're doing this in order to prevent the accumulation of dentin debris. Because we don't want to pack that debris. We don't want to lose our reference point. We don't want to risk deflecting off and causing ledges and perforations. So apical patency will help allow our debris to stay in suspension and be evacuated out coronally. But one would think that if I'm establishing apical patency and I'm taking a hand file past the apical terminus in between each pass of the same nickel titanium file or before I get to my next successive nickel titanium file, that the patient's gonna experience more post-operative pain. Well, in actuality, it's quite the opposite. Dr. Anna Arias out of Spain has done some beautiful research and some amazing, compelling studies that show that post-anodontic pain was statistically significantly less in non-vital teeth when apical patency was maintained. And you gain all the benefits, as you see on the slide, from maintaining apical patency. She did find in vital teeth there was no difference, but let's capitalize on the benefits of apical patency by reducing transportation, by enhancing irrigation at apical one-third, and preventing a whole host of procedural accidents, in addition to allowing our debris to stay in suspension and be evacuated out coronally. Now, when we do our root canal treatment, there are three things you cannot do too much of. Number one, establish apical patency. Number two, refresh your sodium hypochlorite. The effect of sodium hypochlorite is very self-limiting, you know. When Sodium hypochlorite is consumed by organic tissue. You get a reaction called hydrolysis. And hydrolysis, by virtue of its name, you get water. And water does nothing. So we want that reaction of hydrolysis to keep going throughout our procedure. So refresh your hypochlorite as often as you want, as often as you can. Check your working length. What happens to working length in a curved canal when you start to shape the coronal middle third? Well, it decreases. It shortens. So if you start off, let's say, with a 22 millimeter working length and a curved canal, and you continue to use that working length throughout, you'll end up working long. And that could be a problem. So the endo police are not going to come to your office and say, you know what, you've achieved patency way too much. 
or uh, I'm sorry, doctor, but uh, you can only refresh your sodium hypochlorite once or twice during this, uh, during this treatment. I'm telling you right now, these are the defaults. Patency, refresh your hypochlorite, and check and recheck your working length. Now, concept number three is the concept of glide path. We need to create a pathway in which our instruments, our nickel titanium instruments are gonna follow. And we do that by using our hand files. We use our hand files because we have way better tactile control with them. We need to scout the canal. We need to survey the canal with respect to canal curvature, size, and calcification. And once we achieve our, pay, our glide path from orifice to apical terminus, then and only then should we really be taking our nickel titanium files to continue that shaping. And we do this in what we call a watch winding motion, quarter turn clockwise, quarter turn counterclockwise. We can also facilitate this by using motorized hand pieces, reciprocating hand pieces, known as the M4 hand piece. Now, when we look at the criteria for successful root canal treatment, there's a lot of moving parts. And if we follow all these moving parts properly, getting straight line access, finding the canals, negotiating these canals to their apical termini, removing the smear layer, getting rid of the bacteria in their biofilm, obturating the root canal system in three dimensions and subsequently restoring it, we'll find that our success in root canal treatment will be well into the 90s. But we understand the mechanical objectives to create this gradually tapering funnel, and it's with our instruments that's gonna provide us with this ability to internally sculpt that root canal space. Right? And when we go to find that apical constriction, that apical terminus, that's the point we want to shape to, that's the point we want to obturate to, and of course, that's the point we want to clean, clean to. And we can use radiographs. I would trust my apex locator over my radiograph any day of the week. Tactile feel, we're all drawing our root canals, bleeding point on a paper point, and of course, in the next webinar, we'll be talking about apical negative pressure using micro cannulae that are attached to our high volume suction, which can only work if they're within the confines of that root canal space. Remember the three things you can't do too much of. That's like beating a dead horse right now, but I'm gonna tell you right now, when you're working on that case tomorrow and you block yourself out, or you have lost your working length, you're gonna think about what Glassman said and the endo police, right? Patency, refresh your sodium hypochlorite, and check and recheck your working length. Now, during instrumentation, I'm gonna keep it as simple as possible. I don't wanna start alternating between aqueous EDTA and sodium hypochlorite. I'm merely gonna dip my files in a viscous chelator, like RC Prep or Slick Gel, which contains EDTA, which contain, contains urea peroxide, which emulsifies the dental pulp, and I'm gonna instrument through a bath of fresh sodium hypochlorite. It's my final irrigation protocol that we're gonna discuss in webinar three. It's gonna make all the difference. That's what's gonna help us remove the smear layer, get rid of the biofilm, and do a thorough cleansing of that root canal space once we've finished our shaping completely. So when we shape our canals, we do it in a very, very passive manner. We never force instruments, whether they're stainless steel or whether they're nickel titanium. Because if you do, you could end up with a procedural accident can end up with a broken file, right? And that's the last thing you want to have happen in your practice. It can be, often be the most devastating thing if you've never separated an instrument before. And there's lots of nickel titanium files in the, in the uh, concept of fair balance. There's all kinds of ground files. There's heat treated ground files. I've used the twisted files over the years and now my favorite file is TF Adaptive. But the color coding system is pretty intuitive. It's based after a traffic signal where green is the first instrument in sequence, yellow is the second, and red, of course, is the third. Green means go, yellow means continue or stop, and red means stop. Now, let's talk about some terms first. We're all familiar with rotary. Most of us are familiar with reciprocation. Some of us are familiar with adaptive motion. And of course, nickel titanium files now are being heat treated. We're gonna take you through those terms. But we have to understand when a file is rotating continuously in a curved canal, there are two stresses that are placed upon that file. One's called torsional stress 
and the other is called cyclic fatigue. You see, when a file is rotating around a curvature, if the tip of that file gets caught at its most apical point, the rest of that file coronal through it will keep rotating until it reaches a certain angular deflection and that file will break. Ouch! Now, cyclic fatigue is like taking that wire coat hanger or that wire paper clip, right? That metal paper clip and bending it. When a file is rotating around a curve, there are two forces. There are stretching forces on the outer aspect of the curve, compressor forces on the inner aspect of that curvature, and when the disparity becomes too great between the two, just like taking that wire coat hanger, just like taking that paper clip, the file will separate at that point. That's known as cyclic fatigue. These are two negative influences on files that are rotating continuously around a curvature. Now let's look at the metallurgy of nickel titanium files. They have what's called an elastic range. If you take a NITI file and you bend it, and it bends back to its original shape, that's called shape memory. And that file is within the elastic range. As soon as that file undergoes permanent deformation, it enters the plastic range. And if you keep stressing that file while it's in the plastic range, eventually it'll hit the yield point, and that's when a file breaks. And for some of us, it can be the ultimate endodontic nightmare. How do you deal with this? Well, you manage it properly and you prevent it. And that's what we're gonna show you and talk to you about tonight. Because when you look at nickel titanium performance, it depends on three things. The design of the file, the metallurgy or how it's manufactured and how we use it. And the way we use files is called kinematics. That's the branch of mechanics concerned with the motion of objects. And we're all familiar with the different motions that exist, rotary, reciprocation, and now adaptive motion, which is a hybrid between rotary and reciprocation. So a file just rotates in the canal, very simply, right? We all know how that works. And certainly um, the elements motor, which we'll discuss and which has a lot of different presets, K3, TF, you can increase or decrease the the speed at which it rotates. And if you look at that one area that says torque limit, you can increase or decrease the sensitivity at which that file, when it encounters torque, will undergo a safety mechanism called auto reverse. Basically what auto reverse is, when that file's rotating, and all of a sudden it encounters torque, it encounters resistance in that canal, and you can set it to be real sensitive or not so sensitive, It'll do two revolutions counterclockwise and sort of unscrew you from the canal. It's a safety mechanism built in to many of these rotary systems. Not to be confused with reciprocation, where the file will engage and disengage, engage and disengage. The main difference between auto reverse and reciprocation with respect to apical advancement is that with auto reverse, that file will unscrew from the canal. With reciprocation, you can still advance apically when a file is engaging and disengaging. So when we look at pure rotary systems, there's advantages and disadvantages. The main advantage is with pure rotary systems that rotate 360 degrees is that it channels the debris out coronally rather than pushing it apically. But as we saw, the main disadvantages are number one, torsional stress, and number two, cyclic fatigue, all right? important to understand that. These are the disadvantages. Now, pure reciprocation systems, we know which systems those involve. The main advantage is that the file engages and disengages. Engages and disengages as we work our way down to the working length. What does this mean practically? It means an increased resistance to cyclic fatigue. Clinically, less chance for file breakage. Right? We know this through the science. When we look at the cyclic fatigue analysis of files that are either rotating or reciprocating, the reciprocating movement resulted in a significantly longer cyclic fatigue life. But the main disadvantage with many reciprocating systems is that it pushes debris apically and possibly past the apex. And if it pushes it past the apex, it may lead to delayed or maybe non-healing in that area. We know this through the science as well. 
Berkeley had a beautiful study that showed reciprocating files produced significantly more debris compared with rotary files. Dr. David Heramilio, very good friend of mine, looked at TF Adaptive, manual step back, and wave one. And they found that manual step back generated over 200% more debris, and wave one, a reciprocating system, generated almost 60% more debris, respectively. And Dr. Gambarini at the University of Rome, La Sapienza, found that more post-operative pain due to apical debris. Well, let's look at adaptive motion. Wow, this is a whole new era that we're entering. Adaptive motion basically combines the advantages of rotary, the advantages of reciprocation, but minimizes the disadvantages of both. It's like the ABS braking system in your car or the automatic transmission. You don't have to think about it. As soon as that file, which is rotating, encounters torque at a certain predetermined torque limit, it starts to reciprocate on its own without doing anything. You see, there's a continuous feedback loop from file to motor and motor back to file where the motion of the file will self-adjust to the intracanal torsional stresses when the motor is set at TF adaptive in the elements motor, right? So no load on the file, that file will rotate. It's actually what we term in a interrupted rotation where the file will go 600 degrees, 600 degrees, 600 degrees. It accelerates and coasts, accelerates and coasts. Wonderful. And why 600 degrees? Well, we all know that feeling of when that file pulls ourselves down into the canal. Well, we no longer have control over the file, but the file has control over us. So 600 degrees, that interrupted rotation minimizes the pull down. In addition, we have a, what I call a thinking file system. Right? You have a file, you have a motor. When the file encounters torque, you get that continuous feedback loop, file to motor, motor back to the file, and that file will stop rotating and start reciprocating. Fantastic. That's called adaptive motion. As soon as the file engages at a certain torque limit, it reciprocates 370 degrees clockwise and anywhere between zero and 50 degrees counterclockwise. That's called adaptive motion. It does it automatically. So essentially, it's rotary when you want it to evacuate the debris out coronally and reciprocation when you need it in order to increase the resistance to cyclic fatigue. Once again, the advantages of rotary, the advantages of reciprocation, but minimizes the disadvantages of both in adaptive motion. All right, so just to summarize, what's good about it? Well, increased resistance to cyclic fatigue, safer file, less chance for breakage, more file control, and significantly less debris extruded past the apex, which means less post-operative discomfort and a happier patient, of course. So let's look at a technique that you could practically use with many nickel titanium systems. We want fair balance here. And we're gonna talk about a ground file and it could be really a pro taper, it could be a K3, it could be a K3XF, it could be an endo sequence, variable taper technique, where we have files that have the same tip size, but are varied in their taper. Right? For instance, the K3XF, the G Pack, has a 121086 sport taper, all with a 25 tip size. Right? So we're varying the taper, but keeping the tip size the same. In essence, when you do that, the objective is to decrease surface area of contact, not only on the file, but on the canal wall. This will result in a more efficient shaping and less stress on the instrument. So we're essentially controlling fluid engagement on the canal walls and on the file by changing the file taper, but keeping the tip size the same. So let's take a look. Here we've got a canal, let's say, that's being shaped by a file of greater taper. And then we follow that with a file of the same tip size, but a smaller taper. It'll pass through the preparation created and start cutting in a small area of contact way more efficient and way safer for the file. Remember, we're using files of differing tapers, but here the same tip size. And you can set this up in the elements motor at 
K3, K3XF. You can adjust the RPMs. You can adjust the torque limit at which that file will uh, engage and then have that auto reverse function, or you can use them in adaptive motion. You can use most files of most systems in TF adaptive mode. What you're going to get is a safer file. Now, we're going to shape our canal in a crown down manner. In other words, we're going to incrementally remove tissue, debris, bacteria, whatever's in that root canal space, incrementally from the crown down, coronal third, middle third, and then, of course, the apical third. Not only will it improve the distribution of the irrigants, but it's going to facilitate the removal of the canal contents before we even take a shaping nickel titanium file to the working length. Now, we can take an 08 hand file and establish and maintain apical patency throughout to prevent the accumulation of dead and debris, but our shaping files we use in a crown down manner. Now, guidelines for use for any nickel titanium system glide path, pressure, and time. Establish that glide path, that pathway for which our instruments are going to follow. Apply no more pressure than that which would break a sharp lead pencil. And limit the amount of time that you're in the canal with any one nickel titanium instrument. You're in, you're out. You wipe off the debris. Establish apical patency. Refresh your sodium hypochlorite. Go with the next file of smaller taper until you work your way passively without too much pressure down to the apical terminus. Now we're going to divide our root canal preparation into two, the canal taper and then apical preparation. With respect to canal taper, we already talked about that. We talked about a crown down preparation. Now, this is an uninstrumented canal. We're going to start with a larger taper. We're going to go into the canal a couple millimeters, come out, wipe off the debris. We're going to follow that with a file of smaller taper, followed by a file of smaller taper than that, which will pass through the preparation created by the previous two, and finally get to our working length, right? Files of differing taper with the same tip size engage in a small area of surface contact, safer for the file, and certainly more efficient for shaping that root canal space. So we place the canal increment, we place the file incrementally into each canal. Start with the largest taper, when resistance is met, reduce the taper until the working length is achieved. Now, sometimes you can take all the files in that sequence that you're using, whatever sequence you have or whatever file system you're using. Sometimes you may only have to use three instruments to establish our taper, and maybe just sometimes one, depending on the size of the canal, the curvature, and, of course, the density of the dentin. Right? You may have softer dentin that may be easier to shape as opposed to sclerotic dentin, which may be quite difficult. Now, most endodontists will agree on apical preparation. Apical preparation means not just creating that preparation at the apical terminus, but a deep apical preparation in the apical one-third for many reasons based on the science. Canals instrumented to larger apical sizes allow for more irrigant to be placed closer to the apex, right? We no longer think of keeping that apical terminus as small as possible, but now we think about it, keeping it as small as practical. We want to disrupt the biofilm. We want to get our irrigant to that working length, but we also want to do it safely and make it large enough to accommodate our irrigant delivery systems, which we'll talk about in the next webinar next month. Apical preparation at that apical one-third. We enlarge it, we engage it, we get rid of that elliptical shape a little bit and allow our irrigants to get down there a little bit better to get rid of the bacteria and, of course, the biofilm and the smear layer as well. So here's the K3XF, right? K3XF, extra flexible. It's the K3 that Many of you uh, have learned to love and have used over the years, and it's heat treated. And when you heat treat nickel titanium, it increases the flexibility and increases the resistance to cyclic fatigue. Now, when I use my K3XF in a crown down manner, I always like to get to an 06 taper 25 tip size. Now, sometimes I'm at my 06 and I can't get to working length, 
without putting any more pre without putting more pressure on it, and that would break a sharp lead pencil. So I'll go to my 04. And if my 04 goes to working length, I'll recapitulate with my 06, which will follow the pathway created by my 04. It's called the GPAC. Now here's my K3XF cheat sheet, and I'll be happy to send this to you. Uh, all you got to do is send me your email, and I'll send you the K3XF cheat sheet. First thing we need to do is create that glide path, 8, 10, 15. Some like to go to a 20. Now we want to create the taper of our preparation. Take our 12 taper, and you can apical patency in between, 10, 8, and get to our 6. If we get to our working length with a 6, then we can apically prepare. But if we have to push any harder than that, so we'll break a sharp lead pencil, we'll go to our 04. And then we'll recapitulate with the 06. And then we can apically prepare with files that have a smaller taper, but a larger tip size. Remember, apical patency in between each nickel titanium file will only just be a safer way to treat the patient and treat the tooth by preventing accumulation of dentin debris. Very simple, very easy, very, very safe. So in summary, we discussed the role of rubber dam isolation and the benefit for the patient, obviously, it's safer, and the benefit for the dentist, an isolated area. We're working in a nice, clean environment with no saliva around that could interfere with our, our procedure. We understand the importance of straight line access to overall success of endodontic treatment. We talked about the law of color change. We talked about the law of orifice location. We talked about the law of symmetry, right? We wanna make sure that we make good access. We remove all the debris in that root canal, right? We also talked about the, the importance of glide path, that pathway for which our nickel titanium instruments are gonna follow and the importance of apical patency to prevent the accumulation of debt and debris. All right. Thanks so much, Dr. Glassman. Really nice job. We appreciate it. Can you, we have a couple questions from the audience right after you wet your whistle. If you don't mind, can we start just by uh, explaining again the law of symmetry? I know we covered it very <clears throat> in the presentation. If you could touch base on that, would be well. Sure. So mandibular molars will abide, mandibular first molars, will abide by the law of symmetry. So if you have a mesial buccal canal and a mesial lingual canal, and you take a line and you draw it through the center from the mesial to the distal, the distal canal should be symmetrical within the mesial canals. So let's say you've treated the mesial buccal and the mesial lingual, and you draw that line and you only find one distal canal, but it's way off to the mesial. Chances are there's gonna be another distal canal. But if that one distal canal is centered between the two mesials, chances are there's only gonna be one distal canal. Does that help? I'm sure it does. And what we can do also is share that. I know that you have a great visual that would be meaningful to help convey this idea a little bit as well. So we'll send that to our, our, our question as well, and she did say yes, thank you, it did, uh, it did cover that. Another question, if the taper is changed as you shape and crown down, would this require a backfill with warm gutta percha after the master point is fit to fill the larger taper in the coronal area? Well, you can use really any technique. Uh, it's the, the shape of the canal won't dictate how we're gonna obturate the system afterwards. It would be nice if we matched our last file with our master cone, and whether you decide to laterally condense, vertically condense the warm gutta percha and backfill with, let's say, a gun or any other backfill system is really up to you. We have a couple more coming in. Would you mind uh, tracing for us, if you don't have an ultrasonic and are restricted to a round burr, What's your approach for identifying the MB2 in that situation? Is it a tactile exploration and dragging along the pulpal floor? Can you explain that a little more detail? Yeah, it would probably be the very same sort of motion, a very light touch uh, with a surgical length round burr and a slow hand piece. You want to make sure it's surgical length because you want to be able to see behind it properly. If you have a standard length burr, you won't be able to see behind it properly and you won't have the right visuals. So if you're going to use a round burr, be very careful. 
use it in a very light touch and always direct it towards the mesial in a maxillary first molar or maxillary molar and not to it towards the frication. And it's always a very light, I call it an airbrushing sort of feel. Uh, when you take a look at some of the younger operators that you encounter, what's the most frequent error you see among a less experienced clinician? And how do you recommend that the students uh, take steps to avoid that? What I find most often in, in the younger and some of the experience is taking shortcuts. You can't take shortcuts. You have to go through all the steps properly. And that means straight line access, identifying the canals, shaping them properly, right, and going through the proper irrigation protocols as well. You know, if you don't have, for instance, if you don't provide yourself with a proper glide path, and you go right in with that nickel titanium file before you do that because you're excited to use it and you want to get to that apex, you may end up separating that file or transporting the apex or even perforating. So we want to make sure you follow all the steps and please don't take shortcuts. I've been doing this for a long time and I know that when I have taken shortcuts in the past, it only ends up with a procedural accident. A quick one here. Could you mention again the, the name of the burr that manages and cuts through the zirconia and PFM so easily? It's called a Zircut burr, Z-I-R. C-U-T, and that can be obtained by from Kerr Endodontics. When you're comparing, uh, just a quick also point of reference, the apical foramen versus the anatomic apex, to which are they measuring the working length? You measure to the anatom to the, uh, to the apical foramen. The anatomic apex and the apical foramen can sometimes have a discrepancy up to three millimeters or more, and that's why we want to really rely on our apex locator rather than a radiograph because you can have a file that go, depending on the angulation that goes to the anatomic apex but it could be out through the apical foramen by three millimeters or more so it's the apical terminus or the apical foramen that we're measuring what are your thoughts this is from brian what are your thoughts on using gates glidden for orifice opening and then removing dent and triangles um, not a bad idea, Brian. I mean, you can use them if you'd like, but it's really not necessary. Uh, I found that when I used to use Gates Glidden drills, I was removing way too much cervical dentin. Uh, but certainly you can use the small ones, like a one or maximum two, in a drawing motion on the retrieval stroke away from the frication side of the canal if you want to facilitate the removal of some restrictive dentin there. But be very careful with them and only use them in a in a brushing motion on the way out rather than on the way in. And could you please briefly touch on apical patency one more time? Were you saying to extend your instrument beyond the apex briefly? Yes. Apical patency means delivering a small flexible hand file, like an 06 or an 08. I'm not talking about taking a 50 hand file or a nickel titanium file past the apical foramen. If you look at all the stereomicroscopic studies by Bertucci and Cutler and Wu, the average apical foramen, and even the smallest of roots, like the mesial buffer root of a maxillary molar, or the mesial root of a lower molar, is anywhere between 0.28 and 0.34 millimeters in diameter. That's almost a 30, 35 file. So when you take a small flexible hand file, like an 06 or an 08, and you pass it through the foramen, you're not gonna cause any damage to that apical area of the root but you will prevent a whole host of problems, especially the accumulation and compacting of soft tissue and dentinal debris. And once again, contrary to popular belief, what you may think is when you take that and deliver that file past the apical terminus, that the patient's gonna experience more post-operative pain, but in the science that, we, that I quoted with respect to Dr. Anna Arias out of Spain, she found the opposite by Establishing apical patency and delivering that hand file past the apical terminus, 0.25 to 0.5 millimeters, you're going to prevent a whole host of problems rather than contributing to them. Rich, I can't hear you. Sorry about that. 
Yep. We did just advance the deck by two slides. We have a couple of questions that are asking about the irrigation protocol, and I think that's a good place for us to say here's what we're going to be covering in our November sequence for endotherapy. I know that's one of our learning objectives is to talk about that irrigation protocol very specifically. That's correct. We'll talk about apical negative pressure. We'll talk about uh, ultrasonic during our final irrigation protocol types of irrigants that we use, and we're going to look at the science with respect to comparing the efficacy of different irrigant delivery systems on the removal of tissue, not only in the main lumen of the root canal, but also the isthmuses and dentinal tubules, and uh, also the effect on uh, decreasing the bacteria count within the root canal system. Based on your research, it seems that you're aware of it at that level, what, what's on your wish list for endodontic therapy that would help you as an operator in a way that um, will uh, be down the horizon somewhere based on what you see in the literature? That's a great question. Uh, my wish list, and I know it's on the wish list of many of my colleagues, is the is 3D disinfection of the root canal system with minimal removal of tooth structure and then being able to obturate that system in three dimensions conservatively, maintain as much structural integrity of that tooth as possible. And I feel that we are heading with research and development. That's fantastic. All right. Well, on behalf of all of our students, thank you so much this evening, Dr. Glassman. We really appreciated spending the, the time to, to hear your insight and uh, have a, a great sense of pairing up those recommendations with visuals to help guide on everything on color change, law of symmetry. And uh, for those of you who made those type of requests, we will certainly share and make sure that you have the ability to refer to that after our session tonight. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, thank our, our hosts at Kerr Endodontics also for sponsoring this activity. Uh, it's because of their emphasis that we can bring this to you tonight. And if you wouldn't mind, before you leave, take a quick moment to complete the survey and just share your thoughts on things that we can do uh, more effectively as we prepare for our next, uh, our next leg of the race. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rich, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, next month and uh, seeing all you back as well. Thanks, Dr. We really appreciate it. Good night, everyone.